So Hume begins by requiring certainty for knowledge, and this is really limits the possibilities for him. He introduces this distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact. Now, relations of ideas satisfy this requirement for certainty on his conception. Matters of fact, however, not so obviously so. When we look at reasoning regarding matters of fact, we discover that it's founded upon this cause and effect relationship, this principle of connection between ideas. When we explore cause and effect relationships, we discover that they cannot be established a priori, and that they in fact depend on a principle that the future resembles the past. That principle itself cannot be established a priori, and other attempts to establish it seem to be circular and that they presuppose it in order to establish it. As a result, we end up introducing this custom or habit-based explanation of the cause and effect reasoning that results in beliefs of particular matters of fact. This allows us to explain how it is that we form particular beliefs about particular matters of fact because it introduces the experiential component to this necessary connection of cause and effect so that it's this combination of experience and psychological processes that creates our beliefs in matters of fact in this very irrational kind of fashion. But Hume doesn't want to end up with no distinction between this huge swath of beliefs about the external world. And so he introduces his theory of belief, this notion of vivacity or intensity of mental feeling that distinguishes belief from flights of fancy and distinguishes amongst beliefs in terms of their evidential basis. This is a form of a subjective indicator, except the subjective indicator here isn't supposed to be indicative of a relationship to the external world, but merely indicative of a relationship to our evidential base within our subjective perspective. Now, there are a number of potential problems that we can see emerging relatively quickly within Hume's position. Requiring certainty for knowledge really raises the bar very, very high, so that it's difficult to establish any beliefs in contingent propositions if that is our bar for knowledge. Hume nevertheless tries to introduce a correlate to justification to introduce epistemic merit and differentiate between better and worse attitudes towards matters of fact. However, his account of belief seems to preclude any beliefs in anything that we can't actually see, touch, smell, feel, or remember having seen, touched, smelled, felt, and etc., the cause and effect relationship is an association between ideas that come from experience. And so nothing that we don't directly experience is capable of being the subject of the cause and effect relationship, that principle of connection, and hence cannot be something that is a matter of fact, and hence cannot be something that we believe in. We have this theory of belief that distinguishes between these notions of fantasy or imagination and beliefs in matters of fact. But because all of our beliefs have to be grounded in experience, in experiences of causes being related to effects, direct experiences of ideas in our sensations or recollections of experiences of those ideas and sensation, then our theory of belief pretty much tells us that there isn't a way for us to get to belief in things that we can't observe directly with the naked eye in this way. Now, this is problematic because even during Hume's lifetime, we're starting to see the emergence of early elemental chemistry, which is introducing notions, some of them specious, some of them important, phlogiston, oxygen, etc. Whereas elemental chemistry is just getting started. Terrestrial and celestial mechanics are exploding. Newton has published his Principles of Natural Philosophy in 1687, introducing, among other things, gravity as a force that is definitely not directly observable and hence not capable of entering into Hume's cause and effect relationships. There are other examples of this throughout the development of terrestrial and celestial mechanics. For instance, we see the development of 
theories about light, sound, and temperature, all of which hypothesize the existence of theoretical entities that we cannot see. For instance, Newton's 1704 tract on optics introduces his corpuscularian theory of light. Even more problematic, Hume's account of belief seems to preclude our believing things on the basis of testimony or, ironically, historical accounts. Again, the problem seems to be that while we can read all about these different historical figures or we can read all about events in our newspaper, the difficulty lies in the fact that we don't actually see any of these agents. So we can read about Napoleon or we can read about Caesar, but because none of those figures are actually given to us in our experiences so that the cause and effect associations that are supposed to cultivate our belief in their existence are based in our own direct experiences, it doesn't seem like we could actually form beliefs about Napoleon or Caesar, even beliefs like they existed. After all, we also read accounts of unicorns and leprechauns, and we don't suppose that they exist even when the accounts aren't obviously fictitious. Now, Hume famously argues in his section on miracles that we have no reason to believe in the existence of miracles on the basis of testimony. But Hume argues not that testimony is insufficient to generate belief because it doesn't actually connect us to ideas and sensation. Instead, he argues that while testimony seems to bear some evidential weight, that evidential weight is overwhelmed by the massive weight of contradictory evidence from our direct experiences. In fact, miracles seem problematic for his theory of belief, particularly since not only do people seem to form beliefs on the basis of associations that they could never experience in their own lives, but also because they have to be dissuaded from believing in it and oftentimes can't be dissuaded from believing in it on the basis of the fact that their beliefs in miracles contradict all of their associations in lived experience. Finally, and of course most famously, Hume acknowledges in an appendix to the treatise that he has framed his skeptical argument and his positive theses as well, using a psychology that by his own account is unknowable. That is, his psychology is a psychology that is made up of statements of matters of fact and hence can't be known given the conclusions that he reached. So his skepticism is based upon an ontology that it undermines in its epistemology. Hume does acknowledge this. He's not quite sure what to do about it, however. He wants to do something like acknowledge that we have to make assumptions that the world exists, but he doesn't quite get there. He tells us that custom and habit are good and we shouldn't worry about them unless they go astray. And that's almost what Quine does when he relativizes epistemology to the prerequisite assumptions that we make about the nature of the mind, the nature of the world, and the nature of their interactions, assumptions that are necessary both for our positive theories and for the skeptics' challenges to those theories. 